Now, for those of you who don't know or haven't read the description in advance, um, I originally studied sociology and psychology, but in 2007, I somehow stumbled into poker. And long story short, I ended up playing the game on a professional level. And a lot of those things like that you mentioned, I couldn't stop but thinking about the, the, the financial markets and business, as you already know, in general as at the big poker table from many perspectives. For those of you who might ask themselves, what has business and financial market to do with that, that card game? I can tell you a lot. Think about it. You find yourself in an environment where you never know how the thing is going to develop, right? You get dealt cards, some of them you like them, some you don't. All you know is that you don't know, essentially. There's a lot of uncertainty and yet you have to find a way to make decisions. At the same time, you want to have a certain level of mental clarity, right? And on top of that, as if this isn't enough already, you also want to find a way to manage your stress. So from that perspective, I can say, I learned a lot of very valuable lessons at the poker table. And today I'd like to share my, my point of view from those three different things. Um, the decision-making, the mindset, and stress. What are they, or what is each of them, and how do they connect, right? How are they interdependent? Because I think, if we really want to make better decisions, if we want to navigate, especially through that very uncertain time, we must find a way to see the big picture. Because once we do that, we can start playing around with strategies and look for ways that work for us specifically. Because let's be honest, we all are different. What works for person A might not work for person B. And therefore, it always starts with awareness and with an understanding. So as I already said, like, it all started with poker. And when I get into poker, for me, it was all about decision making. I thought, okay, Tino, there's this one thing that you must make sure that works better in your mind, in your head, than in anybody else's head at the poker table. And I call that the cognitive decision making machine. So that means I was really thinking about, okay, how can I use all the technical knowledge that is out there? How can I crunch numbers? What about math? What about game theory? That's how I got into the game. And then I really started working on that. And if you ask me, what is a decision? Or in other words, what is the job of that decision-making machinery, that wonderful piece of evolution that is sitting here in our prefrontal cortex? To me, it is this. Whenever we make decisions, we allocate scarce resources under the condition of uncertainty. Therefore, whenever you say, hey, I'm facing a tough decision, don't complain about uncertainty because uncertainty is part of a decision by definition. Otherwise, it would be just a simple equation. And let's be honest, I think that would be a pretty boring life. Now, when we talk about scarce resources, we usually think about time and uh, money, but I want you to think about many other things. It's about mental clarity. It's about focus. It's about happiness. It's about health, it's about trust and so on. Now, this is how I felt poker, for example, should be played, business should be played, and life as well. And then I learned that a very important piece was missing. Let me introduce to you the thing that I had to learn the hard way at the poker table. Your mindset. Now, while we have this great cognitive machinery that helps us making decisions under uncertainty, but the problem is somebody has to use that machinery, right? And to me, that is really the basis. And this is what the job of the mindset essentially is. And I decided to really put it into concrete pictures because I feel that abstract thing, decision-making mindset is way easier to be remembered if we give it funny names or if we can put it into nice pictures. So we really want to work on our mindset. We really want to educate that little nice looking creature in our head that helps us using um, that decision-making machinery. And what's the job of the mindset? Simply described, it is this. It's really about thinking. And as Lysa already said, I'm a big fan of thinking about how we think. And as we will see today, there's a lot of reason why I would also invite you to do that uh, in many different ways, hopefully even more than you already do in the future. Now, when I say think, it comes in different variations, right? We remember, we interpret, we assume, we perceive. In other words, our mindset's job is 
to really make sense of what we experience in life, right? Really make sense of that big realm of uncertainty where we are trying to navigate through every day. And here we are. We have the mindset and we have the decision-making machinery. And I saw now it's complete in poker and it's complete in business and in life as well. And then I learned now there's something else that can go wrong. Actually, three things can go wrong. First of all, maybe your cognitive decision-making machinery is a little bit rusty because you haven't thought about how to use it that much. You haven't trained it that much. And maybe you haven't slept enough and your energy level is low and therefore this machinery is not working properly. At the same time, and that's the second problem that we face, it could be that our mindset is not well educated. And this is a, to me, very fascinating a field in psychology that we call cognitive biases, right? So it's really about all the different um, flaws in our thinking that we sometimes experience and sometimes, most of the time actually, we don't. We invest money into something and then we can't let it go. We sometimes only see what we want to see and we don't listen to com uh, conflicting evidence and so on. But there's a third thing and this is really what I want to focus on mainly from now on. And this is, and at this point I can promise you, you know who has helped me with my presentation. Six weeks home office with my kids um, made me get more creative. And I'd like to introduce to you the stress monster. Now, stress is really the third reason and it's something I hadn't in mind when I got into poker. But it's really the main reason um, that we have to tackle first because if you have stress, right, in your midbrain, so to speak, in your limbic system, you have no chance getting here to that machinery, right? The controller cannot use the machinery and therefore you are stuck and it's very hard to navigate through uncertainty in those times. Which brings me to the question, what is stress, first of all? Now there are, I haven't counted them, like 500, probably 500,000 different definitions of stress, but I personally think this one really nails it. So when we talk about stress, we really talk about a reaction to change. And this change is something obviously that we experience our whole life at the moment at a very intense level. And it happens on three different levels as well. We have the physical level, we have the mental level, and we have the emotional level. And this is important because on each of those levels, we have different possibilities to intervene and come up with solutions that work for us. So first of all, where does stress really come from? And I'm not the first person ever who has uh, asked this question, but there was also this guy called Richard Lazarus. I think he was, uh, I don't want to go too much into his biography, but he was born 1920 in New York, and he was an American psychologist, and he spent almost all his life really digging into stress, finding answers, how we can understand stress better, what we can do about it. And he came up doing his research in the 70s with a model that he calls the transactional model of stress and coping. And I think he officially published it in 1984 and it has gotten revised and it's really a paradigm shift. Why? Because before that time, psychologists believed that stress is rather coming either from your genes, like it's a physical thing, or it comes from the environment, which means you can put a group of people into a specific environment and all of them would either experience the same level of stress or not, depending on the environment. And what he did, what Lazarus did was, he said, no, that's not, that's not true. It's not the environment and it's not the sensation in your body. It's rather how we think about it. It's not necessarily COVID-19 that causes that stress. It's rather what we associate with it what we think about it. To put it into poker language, what I experienced was that big effect that you can experience at the poker table. How do I think about winning? How do I think about losing? How do I think about developing? How do I think about making mistakes, right? All those things really matter way more than the circumstances um, that you might find yourself in. Now that said, let's put it a little bit into a very practical context. Now let's say you have a wonderful day, 
and you come home and for whatever reason you're curious you take your seat in front of your computer and you check your depot psychologists would say you are facing a potential stressor now unfortunately you realize well uh, my stocks have gone have uh, decreased in value and what happens now is what Lazarus calls the um, primer at uh, the primary appraisal which means nothing else but within a split second you ask yourself the following question what does it mean remember this is the job of the controller in your prefrontal cortex this little nice creature that tries to make sense of what it sees what it hears and what it perceives now there are only three things in, in, this, in, in simple ways to describe that you can categorize an event like this. It's either positive, right? It's hard to imagine for, I think, most of us, but you could say, well, this is a great opportunity because stocks are cheaper than ever and I might buy it, right? Or you could say, well, I don't care. It's irrelevant because I have decided right from the get-go that I'm investing long-term for the next 20 years. Therefore, I knew there will be some swings and from that point of view, it's irrelevant and I move on. Or, and that's a third point, it can be dangerous. Right? And I think that is what we see happening in the markets quite frequently, most likely now, where you see a lot of people experience what is going on right now um, as a challenge, as a threat, and as a potential loss. And when this happens, when we, within a split second, decide, hey, this is dangerous, the second stage occurs. And that's what Lazarus called the secondary appraisal happens right away after the first round. And again, you ask yourself a question. Do I have the resources? Now, you can come up with two answers, right? You can say, yes, of course, I have the resources. You have the money, you have the backup, you have the bankroll, you have the time to survive that whole thing. Or maybe you are a natural born uh, optimist. Or you come to the conclusion, no, I don't. I don't have enough money, I don't have enough time, I may be miscalculated, I may be ignore certain risk, and now I'm really in a stressful situation. And this is what, um, what you can see here, what really happens, where suddenly the control in our head cannot access the machinery anymore because we are caught up in our emotions um, and the stress monster is having a great time, unfortunately. Which brings me to this, so, so to speak, stress equation here. So I'm telling you this because it's important to really understand how stress occurs because that is not only the problem, but this is also the solution. Whenever we encounter a stressor, and we do it all the time in many ways, the moment where we judge it as dangerous, plus uncertainty, well, where we judge it as dangerous, plus there is a lack of resources, if those conditions come together, then we experience stress. Now, of course, Lazarus has said, well, I don't only want to explain how stress happens, but I also want to give people a solution because this is what is really um, where the biggest potential for humanity lies. And he came up with three things. He said, well, we have problem-focused coping, we have emotion-focused coping, and we have cognition-focused coping. So those three, and I've highlighted them because those are the different levels that we can tackle, where we can come up with strategies that work. We can tackle the problem, we can tackle the emotion, and we can tackle the cognition, and which is nothing else but the way we think. A couple of examples how that could look like. The first one, problem-focused coping. Now think about a tough conversation with a boss, or it could be your wife, your husband, or whomever, right? This is one of those situations where we at least have a certain level of control, right? We can prepare for it, we can get some training. In other words, we can do something to eliminate or to change the situation or the stressor, right? Those are the things you can decide, for example, if you grab your phone, if you place it next to your bed during so that you can grab it during nighttime, or if you turn it off or put it far away. Those are things we have control of. In other words, the job here on that level is we want to solve the problem or we want to get rid of the problem. 
right? Which doesn't mean, of course, you want to kill your boss or anything. Um, you find a different situation. A couple of suggestions how we could do it. Can you see in that box? Typically, as Lights already said, there's training. Invest in yourself. There's learning. You can set clear goals. You can structure your work, something that I can't overstretch um, for many reasons. Um, and you can have a social network. Things that you already do here, um, I think that's a wi very wise decision um, that you showed up to Minds Again. Which brings me to the second thing, when we focus on emotions. Emotions uh, focus coping. Now sometimes, right, we have no chance, we cannot get rid of the problem, we cannot solve the problem, right? We cannot click a button and say, hey, COVID-19, and it vanishes, right? We cannot say, I wish the stock market would turn into a bull market again. It's not going to happen just because we wish it would be that way, right? Those situations could be financial losses, losing a job, or bad news, or we get sick, whatever it is. In those situations, what we can do, however, is we can, um, we can deal with the emotional arousal. In other words, we feel, for example, anger, anxiety, and we have this physical tension. We can look for ways to work with our emotions, right? For example, if you decide to go into the biz investment business, or if you decide to buy ETFs, one thing is for sure, there will always be a time where you lose money. That's what I experienced in poker and the game called poker all the time. If you try to change that game, you lose right away because it's impossible. You have to accept it. However, what you can do is you can work on your emotional level and how you respond emotionally. How can that look like? We have uh, had the nice introduction by Natalie, who did some breathing techniques, a short meditation. That's one of the short-term things we can do. Now imagine if you do that on a regular basis, this and science prove that in many ways, you can change your emotional um, alertness and the way you deal with emotions and the, the intensity of emotions by meditating over a long period of time, if you make it a habit. We also have exercising, moving, especially these days I think where we um, hang around in front of the computer, from my point of view, way too much by necessity it's even more important to exercise, right? Ride a bicycle, for example. It's a, it's a very practical tip that Lisa gave as well. Social context, talking. And then we look for things outside that one problematic area, so to speak. It could be hobbies, it could be friendships, things that really help you to get in a better mood even when things get really tough. Or at least that you enable yourself to really relax in moments of very high intensity. And then we have the third thing, which I think is, from my point of view, probably the most interesting one. And it's also the toughest one because it is, we can change how we think. Because imagine, or remember, when we have problems, we can either solve them or we can avoid them. Sometimes we can't do both, then we have to deal with our emotions. Now imagine what you could do, how your perception could change if you start looking at things differently, it would change everything. And this is what I, for example, have learned at the poker table that there are many different ways how you can look at mistakes, how we can look at uh, losing. And from that point of view, I think it's a great opportunity, a crisis like this, where people really have the opportunity to learn about themselves, how they really think about money, how they really think about losing, how they really think about what is valuable to them, right? Change your thoughts will change your emotions and will also change your physical reaction in your body and therefore it will reduce stress. What can change, I've listed a couple of them, right? problems become opportunities, mistakes can become valuable because you start learning something and uncertainty suddenly becomes a chance instead of a pure source of um, stress. Now, of course, we read about these things these days, I think in social media all the time. Sometimes, that's my experience, people have a big resistance to those sayings. And my explanation for that is because they are rather still stuck in that emotional state um, of arousal where they are so stressed that for them at this time, it's not possible to look at things the different way, which at the same time is a great indicator that you want to train 
your mindset, that you want to send your mindset to the gym. What can you do about it? Everything that helps you to change new perspective. It can be an open-minded talk. It can, again, be meditation. It can be um, something that I really like uh, beside the coach. There are tons of great coaching formats, but I really like improv theater myself where you can dive deep into uncertainty in a very safe frame and you can try out new things. And comedy is the same. Think about it. The core element in comedy is to look at one thing from that many angles that you will be able to find even the, uh, find something fun in even the most serious topic, right? And that's, I think, what we need these days even more. It should be pretty clear that we want to use all those three strategies the whole time. Meaning, we want to be able to tackle problems that we can tackle. At the same time, we want to be able to regulate our emotions by using different techniques. And of course, we want to train our mindset. We really want to understand how we think and then decide do we like it or is there anything that we can do differently in the future. And that brings me to I don't want to call it homework, but to an invitation. An invitation that I encourage you to maybe think about. Three questions. Now, given that you have the, the broad picture here, you know what decisions are, you know the role of the mindset, you know what stress is and how all those three things are interconnected. Right? You can play around with those questions yourself. Where does your stress come from? The next time you have stress, ask yourself, is that a problem I can solve? Is there some training that I can take? Or is that maybe something where in specific situations, for example, when I have to give a speech or have to give a presentation, I always get nervous, um, I have this anxiety, then my, my palms start sweating. Is there something I can do about this? And there certainly is. Or is it that whenever I make a mistake, I blame myself. This could also be something that you write down immediately and then you can start working on it. Ask yourself as a second step, what action could I take? Right? And I bet, first of all, you have seen a couple of that, uh, possible actions and list them down. You don't have to do all of them, right? but really list them down. And then do something very simple, but very important. Pick one and do it. And I know there might be some questions, and I know that we have a um, Q&A where you now have the chance to ask some questions. However, I suggest we can uh, connect. If you have any questions, you can send me an email or you can check out my LinkedIn profile. We'll also post a couple of um, articles on a regular basis about those different topics.